morning. My name is Shelley Joy, and today I am presenting the Pribram Bohm Theory of Consciousness. A little background. I have degrees in electrical engineering, Indian philosophy, and consciousness studies, and earlier this year I defended my doctoral thesis on the Pribram Bohm Holoflex Theory of Consciousness and showed how it provides direct support for the theories of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin concerning the evolution of consciousness. In 1916, the young French scientist, priest, and mystic Teilhard de Chardin said, We are the countless centers of one in the same sphere. These words encapsulate the paradigm I'll be describing today. My hope is that this quote will grow in meaning for you by the end of my presentation. My interest in radio communication led me to the thesis that consciousness must have an electromagnetic component. To my delight, I found supporting material in the theories listed here. But in reading Perbem and Bohm, I experienced one of those aha moments. I realized that electricity is only part of the story, and I began to focus on the work of Pribram and Bohm. Here we see the young physics professor David Bohm at Princeton in 1949, a neighbor and friend of Albert Einstein. At the time, Bohm was writing his 600-page textbook, Quantum Theory. Bohm began his career with a fascination for plasma, one of the four fundamental states of matter, the others being solid, liquid, and gas. Plasma constitutes over 99% of the matter of the universe, and it is the primary constituent of cosmological structures such as stars and gas clouds. Bohm's early research began in Berkeley, where he completed his dissertation in plasma physics in 1944 under Robert Oppenheimer. As Bohm studies the plasmas, he became struck by their extraordinary nature. They began to take on, for him, the qualities of living beings. When he introduced an electrical probe into the plasma, it would generate a charged sheath around the probe, which neutralized its effects on the plasma, as if the plasma were protecting itself and seeking homeostasis. To Oppenheimer's surprise, Bohm put forth an entirely new theory of the plasma state, supported with a mathematical model. This was immediately put to use by Oppenheimer's team to separate U-235 from U-238, a critical step in the effort toward building a thermonuclear bomb. Immediately, Bohm's dissertation was classified top secret, and it was only with considerable effort that Oppenheimer was able to persuade the regents to grant Bohm a doctorate without publishing his dissertation. Thirty years later, and now Chair of Theoretical Physics at the University of London, Bohm writes, Let me propose that consciousness is basically in the implicate order. What does Bohm mean here by the implicate order? Twenty-five years after writing Quantum Theory, Bohm had arrived at the conviction that the universe consists of two distinct domains, the implicate order and the explicate order. I'll discuss these in detail soon, but first I want to also introduce the other half of Holoflux theory. Carl Pribram passed away this February at the age of 95. He was the author of well over 700 publications, and he continued to teach and lecture well into his 90s. The essence of Holoflux theory can be summarized in Carl's words. The medium that allows us to observe the cosmos is radiation. Bohm called the background radiation of the universe the quantum potential. The structure of this background radiation is holographic. Since the 1940s, Carl had been carrying out experiments at the Yerkes Primate Research Center in Florida in search of the mysterious Engram, the location of memory storage within the brain. But he and his colleague, Carl Lashley, were unable to discover any specific location for memory storage. After years of research, Carl published his holonomic brain theory, in a long series of experiments, he discovered three-dimensional electric fields within the spatial volume of the dendritic webs of cerebral cortex depicted to the right in the figure. Carl's extensive lab data strongly suggested evidence of holographic field transformations as the fundamental mechanism in perception. In mapping voltage potentials within the cerebral cortex, he discovered that when coefficients of identical value are connected, a contour map appears. He called these maps holoscape contours. Carl noticed how these patterns are similar to fractals. 
They are composed of vertically oriented spine-produced dipoles embedded in horizontal dendritic polarization fields, which he said constitutes a quantum neurodynamics. This picture of David Bohm and Carl Pribram dining out in Prague was taken shortly before Bohm's death in 1992. Pribram and Bohm, the quantum physicist and the brain scientist, had become close friends over two decades of technical discussion. While Pribram's interests lay in understanding the mechanisms of perception, memory, and consciousness, Bohm was more interested in the ontological reality underlying the universe. Bohm and Pribram held a common vision of the hologram as key to understanding consciousness. They also held the Fourier transform as fundamental in the mechanism of information storage and consciousness, both within the brain and throughout the cosmos. Together they pioneered a theory that is quite unconventional, certainly outside of mainstream thought in physics and neurophysiology, and yet their holoflux theory is coherent and applicable for understanding consciousness and the cosmos. Now to holoflux theory itself. First, consciousness manifests as energy flux. Pribram found holonomic information encoded within electromagnetic flux in the cranium. For Bohm, consciousness resonates between two domains, a space-time explicate and the non-dual implicate. And finally, that the implicate order is at the center everywhere. Below a spatial scale of 10 to the minus 35 meters, the Planck length. So just what is the Planck length? This value was determined by the father of quantum mechanics, Max Planck, and published in his famous paper in 1900, which began quantum theory. Planck used fundamental constants of the universe, including the speed of light and the gravitational constant, to calculate the values of a Planck length and a Planck time. The Planck length is constrained by the speed of light. Here is a simple check. An incident photon, a single quantum of energy, moves in from the left and traverses the distance of one Planck length. What is its velocity? Dividing the distance traversed one Planck length by the elapsed time, one Planck second, yields the speed of light, which is known to be 10 to the 8th meters per second. To better understand the topology of the implicate and the Planck length, a thought experiment is useful here. Visualize a sphere or spherical shell anywhere in this room. It could be on the tip of your nose or on the tip of your tongue, but select a point upon which to focus. Now let's begin moving inward, geometrically moving toward the center. Imagine that as we move, we are shrinking in scale by leaps of 10, moving always inward toward the center. Soon we find ourselves at the molecular level of 10 to the minus 15 meters, the diameter of a proton the center of a hydrogen atom. At a million times smaller than a hydrogen atom, we reach 10 to the minus 18th, the size of the electron. And at 10 to the minus 17 meters in the range of the Higgs boson, we are as deep as contemporary measurements have been able to go using the Large Hadron Collider. But we continue shrinking inwards and moving toward the center until we reach the bottom, the Planck length of 10 to the minus 35 meters. This is the end of the line. We have reached the bottom limit of space at the center. Or have we? Bohm doesn't think so, and I quote from page 193 of Wholeness and the Implicate Order. To suppose that there is nothing beyond this limit at all would indeed be quite arbitrary. Rather, it is very probable that beyond it lies a further domain or set of domains of the nature of which we have as yet little or no idea. Now let's examine the Planck length in the context of an image provided by Bernard Carr, professor of mathematics and astronomy at the University of London, where Bohm taught. In Carr's diagram, we see the head of a snake swallowing its own tail. The body of the snake represents the entire spatial scale of the universe. Moving counterclockwise along the body of the snake, we can see various scale-dependent phenomena. Starting at the head, we shrink in scale, moving from the outer universe through galactic clusters and galaxies to planets, mountains, molecules, electrons, until we reach the tail at the Planck length. Now let's grasp the snake by the head and pull down from the tail. 
Here we see the same scale starting at the top of the diameter of the universe at 10 to the plus 25 meters. Moving downwards, we shrink until we arrive again at the bottom where we find the tail at 10 to the minus 35 meters, the Planck length. At the end of the explicate order, at the bottom of space, the implicate order begins. It is apparent that this limit exists hidden everywhere at the center of space. But this diagram may be misleading, as space is neither two-dimensional nor linear. A higher dimensional view is an order. Bohm, going even further, tells us that here at the bottom of space, reality constitutes an actual plenum. He states, what we perceive through the senses as empty space is actually the plenum, which is the ground for the existence of everything, including ourselves. The things that appear to our senses are derivative forms, and their true meaning can be seen only when we consider the plenum, in which they are generated and sustained, and into which they must ultimately vanish. This is strikingly reminiscent of the previously discredited ether concept, a core belief of 19th century physics. Now recalling that the holoflux theory posits consciousness as energy flux resonating between two domains, the explicate and implicate, the question now arises, what is the relationship between the energy of consciousness within the implicate order and the energy of consciousness within the explicate order? What is the mechanism of information interchange between the two? For an answer, we turn to the following diagram. Pribram obtained this diagram during a presentation by the Berkeley physicist Geoffrey Chu, who told Pribram that he had received it from Henry Stapp, who himself received it from Paul Dirac. Dirac's original paper, The Principles of Quantum Mechanics, published in 1930, contained 785 equations. Dirac's diagram can be seen to greatly simplify the relationships between major concepts of quantum theory as he understood it. Central to the diagram is the Fourier transform. This is the operational bridge between the two domains, the spectral and space-time. And at the very bottom of the diagram we find Planck's constant, conceptualized here as where the action is. A brief review of the Fourier transform is in order. In 1822, Fourier published a paper describing mathematical relationship that models the flow of energy between two domains. The equation on the left transforms information from the frequency domain into the time domain. The equation on the right transforms information from the time domain into the frequency domain. In this example, we see an engineering application of Fourier transform processing. Incoming music is detected by a microphone at the left. At regular intervals, the acoustic wave is sliced by a frequency splitter into 16 distinct frequencies. The amplitude of each frequency is recorded, and thus the space-time music has been converted to spectral data. The frequency data can then be unpacked and mixed before emerging from the speaker on the right once more in space-time. The Holoflux theory posits that the energy of consciousness operates in a somewhat similar fashion moving in and out between the two domains. This slide shows Bohm's implicate order and explicate order within the context of Dirac's diagram. The implicate order lies within Dirac's spectral region on the left. The explicate order is congruent with space-time on the right. Again at the center we see the Fourier transform. But to understand abstract relationships such as these, it is more useful to view the relationships geometrically through topological considerations. Here we see at the center a Planck holosphere, separating the outer explicate from the interior implicate order. For simplicity, only three isospheres are shown, but in actuality we should consider many, one for each quantum frequency perhaps, in the vast spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Each isosphere will resonate at the unique frequency fixed by its diameter and each frequency resonates with the same corresponding frequency within the implicate order. Each space-time isosphere will have a finite information storage capacity, which has been calculated by Jacob D. Beckenstein. As a graduate student under John Archibald Wheeler, 
Bekenstein pioneered the mathematical details of black hole thermodynamics. He defined the qubit as the smallest possible storage area in space-time, having an area of one square Planck length. The upper limit to the information that can be contained upon the surface of a specific finite volume of space has come to be known as the Bekenstein bound. Using simple geometry and the equation for the surface area of a sphere, we can calculate the maximum number of bits of information or qubits that might be stored on the surface of a one centimeter sphere. The answer is 10 to the 64 bits of information. Another example, particularly appealing to those of you who may consider the blood as a possible conveyor of consciousness, is the erythrocyte or red blood cell, that mysterious cell that has no nucleus whatsoever, yet is ubiquitous throughout our body. If we consider the diameter of a typical erythrocyte, about 10 microns, the number of bits of information that can be stored on an isosphere bounding such a cell is 10 to the 60th bits. Note that by comparison, the U.S. government's Utah Data Center has a reported capacity of merely 10 to the 18th bits of information. One final piece of the Pribram bohm topology concerns the inclusion of time into the equation. How does the Planck time influence the proposed holoflux process? Using Wheeler's famous self-observing U, an image he often used as shorthand to indicate the cosmology of the universe viewing its own creation, this slide expressed the fundamental clock cycle of the cosmos to be the Planck time of 10 to the minus 44 seconds. The implication here is enormous. We can only begin to imagine the cosmos as we know it operating at such a clock cycle collapsing in and out of the explicate order at a rate of 10 to the 44 cycles per second. To summarize the Pribram bohm topology, we have here overlaid the image of an iris at the boundary of the implicate-explicate order. The implication is that consciousness is looking out from within the implicate into the explicate order of space-time. Conversely, we could say that the local space-time is a projection of the non-local implicate order into the local explicate order. Does this provide an adequate and applicable solution to the hard problem of consciousness? Pribram summarizes his thinking here at the age of 94. These two domains characterize the input to and output from a lens that performs a Fourier transform. On one side of the transform lies the space-time order we ordinarily perceive. On the other side lies a distributed and folded holographic-like order referred to as the frequency our spectral domain. What might be some implications of the Pribram bohm theory, particularly for consciousness studies, yoga, and paranormal research? Those of you familiar with yoga may notice that the view is congruent with that of the 9th century Advaita yoga philosopher Vachaspasti Mishra, who posits here that it is Purusha, from which Bohm calls the implicate or spectral order, that looks out and sees the knowledge of the space-time mind. The Q transform in this image is David Bohm's quantum potential equation. The implications are that consciousness, the experience itself, is not a function of nerve impulses flowing among the neurons, but of radiant energy operating lens-like to focus and tune in the frequency domain. This image from a medical textbook shows the hollow ventricular cavities filled with clear cerebrospinal fluid. It is assumed that these cavities merely cushion the brain from concussion due to outside impact. However, it seems implausible that such beautiful streamlined shapes, so much like microwave horn antennas, should have evolved in the center of the cranium merely to cushion us from blows to the head. The ventricular cavity at the center of the brain may be thought of as a lens through which the interior implicate order looks out into the explicate order, seeing images of space-time projected on the interior surface of its folds. This diagram from Rajasthan indicates the third eye chakra, the so-called seat of clairvoyant powers, at the precise location of the ventricular cavities. Similarly, we see depicted the Ankh symbol on the pharaoh's forehead, indicating the acquisition of the all-seeing power of consciousness. And in this x-ray from the front of the face, the ventricular cavities can be seen in the exact location depicted by occult illustrations of the third eye. 
Finally, I'd like to close with a quote which, with which we began. On the eve of a major battle at Verdun in 1916, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote in his journal, We are the countless centers of one and the same sphere. Thank you.